So, um, coronavirus uh, and COVID-19, um, probably all well known to you now, um, are that coronavirus is a large family of viruses that cause infections ranging from the common cold to severe acute respiratory syndrome. All else. And it's now uh, over a year since uh, the first reports of this new coronavirus uh, came through from China, um, later named as SARS-CoV-2. That's the virus name and that's the virus that causes COVID-19. As a, a new virus or a novel virus, SARS-CoV-2 has spread widely because of the lack of immunity in the population. And this means that everybody in the population across the world is susceptible. And of course, we've seen how it's um, spread widely over this last year. And it is now over a year since those first cases were found and we're now dealing with the new variants and viruses um, as described. The symptoms, again, we're probably now very familiar with, with the key symptoms and they remain the triad uh, of uh, a new continuous cough, high temperature and a loss or change in your normal sense of taste or smell, which is anosmia. There are, of course, other symptoms that people report, but the uh, most common symptoms remain these triad of key symptoms. Most people develop the symptoms within um, five to 11 days of exposure, and the symptoms usually last for about five to six days. But this phenomenon of deterioration after day seven um, is uh, certainly um, a well-known issue, and a number of people are admitted in the, to hospital in, in that second week of, of uh, symptoms. Presentation may be atypical in the elderly, um, and of course, asymptomatic or poorly symptomatic disease is also recognised. So spread of COVID-19, um, this um, remains um, similar to the, the spread that we're familiar with, with other respiratory diseases. So it's mainly through respiratory droplets, coughing, sneezing, spreads diseases. Um, and contact with respiratory secretions. So when those respiratory droplets settle out onto surfaces, then hands can become contaminated and touching uh, surfaces and then contaminating yourself is a key issue. Aerosol generating procedures is the um, term that we use for those procedures where aerosols, smaller uh, uh, particles are generated, which are more effective at um, spreading um, the virus with the uh, particles remaining in the air for longer um, and um, spreading a wider distance than the two metres. Um, and aerosol generating procedures include uh, intubation and those sorts of procedures. And there is a list in the IPNC guidance uh, of those procedures. The new variants of virus are more transmissible, but to date the mode of spread has not deemed to have changed. So they're just more effective at um, transmitting on to uh, second or third cases rather than it being a change in the mode of spread. So respiratory droplets remains the main mode of spread. Very quickly, because I'm conscious of time, um, the guidance that you need to refer to in relation to care homes um, is through the Welsh Government website there on the right. And we also have care home guidance linked from the Welsh, Gu Welsh Government site and also on our own site in Public Health Wales. And we have um, a PHW advisory note on the use of PPE in social care settings available through our main Public Health Wales website for COVID under the information for uh, um, healthcare professionals uh, in the bottom blue uh, square there. Um, and this is the document that you can find in that uh, way. Current UK COVID-19 IPNC guidance, as I say, Gail and I sit on the UK IPNC cell uh, group um, and this latest update was published on the 21st of January um, and is uh, now addressing the need to maintain services within health and care settings as we move into this um, further phase of the pandemic. Uh, and um, this guidance reinforces all the practices and did take into consideration the, the new evidence on the new variants, etc. So that's a very quick uh, run through of the of the key guidance on COVID. All is underpinned by um, 
IPMC evidence base and in Wales we've adopted the National Infection Prevention and Control Manual from uh, Scotland which is to be adopted across the UK in due course and you can find that um, manual at the link there and from our website. So as, as you heard at the beginning, um, the IPNC uh, checklist template um, is uh, out and part of the reason why we've put this webinar together to support you with the key elements that are picked up in that uh, IPNC template. So you can see here the first page of the template and then um, the um, list of the key elements. Um, which uh, what start with standard infection prevention and control measures, at which point um, I'm hoping that Amanda Daniel is on the call um, and that she will be able to pick up the um, next part of the presentation. Uh, this is Amanda Daniel, who's the community IPNC lead nurse for HARP. Amanda, are you there? Yeah, I am. I'm sorry, I dropped out. So I've just... Um... Uh, so thank you very much, Ilari, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about standard infection prevention and control precautions. And these are basic measures, basic interventions to prevent transmission of infection. Um, and that includes the use of PPE, uh, which uh, um, uh, I think believe Gail is going to talk in a, a bit more detail about different scenar scenarios and different types of PPE used at different levels. So in order to reduce exposure and transmission, we have to look at ways that we can intervene. So um, included in that is cough etiquette to reduce exposure. What about contamination of hands when well, we can look at uh, hand hygiene? Also in to reduce exposure, identifying symptomatic residents and isolating them, but also decontamination of the environment. So cleaning, cleaning is a really important source of reducing environmental contamination. So when should infection control precautions be, uh, be implemented? Well, it, they should apply in all settings for all staff, for all residents, where there's a risk of contact with body, blood and body fluids and sometimes we know that residents will have an infection at other times we won't so these precautions will apply in in all situations now the main interventions to prevent and reduce transmission of uh, coronavirus as we all know includes distancing and this should be uh, measures that are implemented within the care home for everybody uh, so in, we need to be able to keep at least two metres apart unless you're providing direct care. And that involves having a conversation. This might also involve uh, joint break times. The other thing we can do is wash our hands frequently. So hand hygiene for at least 20 seconds. Um, and you can use either uh, soap and water or alcohol based hand rub. And that's generally before and after contact with a resident. PPE is also going to be an effective measure to prevent transmission, but also um, know this can be difficult and challenging, but for staff to report any symptoms or if they are significant contacts of anyone who is a, a confirmed a case. So in order to reduce exposure for coughs and sneezes, what do we do? Or we'll catch it, bin it, kill it. So the use of single use tissues to be encouraged when sneezing or coughing, touching your nose, and those to be disposed of quite promptly afterwards, preferably in a closed foot operated waste bin, just to avoid touching and contamination of others. After that, you should clean your hands with soap and water um, or use alcohol-based hand gel, or if you have had any contact with respiratory secretions or contaminated objects. So that includes frequently touched surfaces, um, door handles, light switches, these kinds of things, decontaminate your hands afterwards. And the portal of entry is, any, is our mucous membrane, so we want to avoid touching our eyes, mouth and nose. And also to give, to give assistance to our residents so that they contain their respiratory secretions. So making sure it's all, uh, always accessible for them to have tissues and hand wipes. So we've got two types of hand hygiene that we can use. Uh, we can either use soap and water, liquid soap. The type of soap is not important. It's really about the technique to ensure that your whole hand has been decontaminated. And you can use um, both types interchangeably. What we would say is, though, if your hands are visibly dirty or there's an outbreak of 
of uh, diarrhea and vomiting, you should wash your hands with soap and water. But all time, other times you can use uh, alcohol gel, which contains at least 70% alcohol, and that will be effective against the virus. We know that hand hygiene is the single most important measure in reducing the spread of infection. And just to note, please don't use sinks that you might be using to dispose of other bodily fluids. That's really important. So top tips uh, for good hand hygiene include making sure in order to wash your hands that you are clear or bare below the elbow. So if you've got long sleeves, please roll them up. Um, if you're wearing watches and bracelets, bracelets remove them or you can roll up, uh, move up uh, any uh, bracelets that are worn for religious measures. Uh, try and avoid any rings that have gems uh, because they tend to harbour organisms and germs. Likewise, long nails, chip nails, false nails will also harbour organisms underneath the nail and you can't effectively wash them. And also we've got bacteria on our skin, so please cover cuts and abrasions and uh, use a waterproof dressing. And also we want to protect our hands, so having emollients um, that aren't shared uh, to protect your skin afterwards. And just a reminder, the five moments, the WHO five moments for hand hygiene, very good if you want to have posters to remind uh, people when to wash their hands. So generally before and after contact with a resident, before and after contact with any bodily fluids. And when you leave the, the resident area or any contact with uh, residents, belongings uh, or bed tables, that kind of thing. Just remember to decontaminate your hands. So our two um, modes are include soap and water. So you can find uh, how to wash your hands on various videos. There's a link there. So make sure that you run your hands under uh, warm water. That's really for for comfort and to prevent damage to your hands. Run your, run your hands under a tap first, then add your liquid soap. And then the rest of the steps are about technique to ensure that your whole hand has been decontaminated. So frequently missed areas of the palms, the tips of the fingers, the uh, where the where the hands interlock, thumb areas and wrist areas. So you take a lot by about 20 seconds and you can sing your favorite tune. I understand at the minute it's I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor, so you can use that to ensure that you're taking the uh, the right amount of time. And to dry your hands, it's really important that your hands are not wet because they can also harbour germs, so paper towels. And then try not to recontaminate your hands by using your elbows to turn off taps or using a paper towel. So it's exactly the same with hand gel. The amount of gel, you know, you cup your cup the, the hand gel into the, your your hands and the amount will depend on how big your hands are, but enough to cover the entire surface of your hand. And again, using the entire, um, um, using the techniques described here to make sure all parts of your hands are decontaminated. Again, that's 20 to 30 seconds. What about residents? Well, they should be encouraged as well to clean the hands after coughing, sneezing, before eating, after going to the toilet and making sure they're available because people are much more able to, to um, decontaminate the hands if they've got wipes that are accessible. And that includes visitors as well. So when they are able to visit, making sure they're available when they enter, when they leave the setting and, and in between also. So um, I think that's, uh, that's my section. Uh, moving on to uh, PPE now, and I think Gail's going to take over. So thanks a lot for listening. Thanks, Amanda. And Gail, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Gail Usardi, consultant nurse as part of the HARP team involved in healthcare associated infection. I'm just going to pick up on specific PPE in relation to COVID-19. PPE forms part of standard infection control precautions, as Amanda's already outlined. Uh, but to address the transmission route specifically of this organism, there is specific PPE that needs to be worn. So in line with the UK IP and C guidance, and this, this information is contained on the advisory note on Public Health Wales uh, website, uh, for direct uh, resident care and within two metres, there's a requirement to wear single-use gloves, single-use aprons, a fluid repellent surgical mask and eye protection if you're looking after somebody who's suspected or known of uh, being infected with COVID-19. And as you will see, as you go down the line when performing a task, when you're not in direct contact, you've got surgical face mask and eye protection if there's a risk of splash. 
and if you're just circulating in the home and not having any contact, not within two metres, then the surgical mask is still required. So one of the key items to prevent um, infection to your cells is the surgical fluid uh, repellent uh, face mask. And uh, we'll go on to describe some of um, the ele elements as we go along now. So it's 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 good to have good PPE, but unless it's worn correctly, unless it's changed at the right time, unless it's accompanied by the other standard infection control precautions, it's not going to be protective of, of you or your residents. And I've just uh, put down there that you, you have to make sure that everybody is trained to put on, which is called donning, and to remove, which is called doffing the PPE, um, you know, correctly. Otherwise, you risk contaminating yourself or your residents um, in the use of PPE. And as outlined, PPE is just one element of the hierarchy of controls for IP and C. Uh, just to note that while you've got PPE on, you have to be aware of what you might be touching. So we're all very familiar walking around with our phones in our pockets, etc. But you really should not be touching anything once you've got your PPE on, which isn't related to the task that you're performing. And we have got some guidance on mobile de devices and how to clean and what on the good practice points, which you can also find on our website. So a little thing about gloves. OK, um, they are single use. They need to be changed after different tasks with the same patient. So the examples given you helping somebody to toilet and mouth care. Well, one is is more or less a clean procedure. The other one is more or less a dirty procedure. So you need to be changing your gloves and your aprons between different tasks with each patient and between patients as well. So always remove your gloves and wash hands after handling body fluids. Always wash your hands or use alcohol gel after removing your PPE. Gloves are like nice, warm, moist environments that bacteria and viruses can multiply quite quickly in there. And just to say that it is not acceptable to be using alcohol gel on top of gloves. It actually changes the properties of them and can allow organisms to go through the, the product. So it's about changing them and hand hygiene each time. You really need to be careful not to touch your nose and your face once you've got your gloves on because uh, they will be contaminated. And so if you touch those key areas, nose, mouth, face, then you are risking contaminating yourself. Disposable plastic aprons are intended to just cover that area of your uniform, which is most likely to become contaminated. Um, in the UK, we have always um, advocated bare below the elbow because it's it's very effective to wash up to your forearms uh, to remove any contamination rather than wearing additional uh, a PP on top of that. So wear your apron uh, for contact with your resident for providing care and again change after each task and with with after each patient. OK, so we come to masks. So there's a lot of discussion in the media about what is a, a surgical mask, what is um, what is a face covering. The, the fluid repellent surgical masks have got uh, a fluid repellent layer within them to stop the droplets uh, soaking through. And they also alter, uh, offer some filter capacity as well to the air that you're actually breathing in. Um, so. FRSM masks are intended as PPE to protect you as the worker, whereas face coverings are intended to protect others around you in case you are actually infected. So that's why members of the public are expected to wear face co co coverings in public places. You are expected to wear um, a fluid repellent surgical mask as PPE to protect yourself from the risks of COVID-19. So you can wear your mask sessionally and we'll 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 bring up a description of that. Um, but once your mask is on, you need to make sure that it's worn correctly. And what we see is on the news, lots of pictures of staff um, in care homes, in acute settings and also members of the public wearing their masks incorrectly. So with it, you know, down below their nose. Um, with it not fitting correctly around the, the neck, with it being drawn down, being hanging off one year, any of those incorrect uh, placements of the mask are going to put you at significant risk. So, you know, you see people 
pulling the mask down to talk to their colleagues. Well, you're removing your protection every time you do that. If you touch your mask to readjust it, um, then your hands are going to get contaminated with whatever's on the outside of, of the mask. If you do have to touch your mask, you need to make sure that you are uh, cleaning your hands once again. And when you put your mask on, you need to make sure that it's fitting correctly so that it's ready to go and you won't have to keep adjusting it. So if you have a small face and it is it, it, it keeps sliding, you need to make adjustments. And there are ways of doing that by tying the loops at the side or twisting the loops. And there are devices that can stretch between the loops to get you a better fit. But it's important that you fit it correctly in the first place. Eye protection, um, most of you will either be using uh, safety goggles or be using visors and these are mainly uh, supplied as single use and they will be marked as such with a circle with a two and a cross in it. Uh, and if you are using reusable items, every time you take it off, you need to make, to make sure that you are disinfecting those items thoroughly and you should not be sharing your eye protection with somebody else. So um, online you will find the advisory note with the guidance and so just to clarify when per when providing personal care which right requires you to be in direct contact with uh, a, a resident then you will need to wear a fluid repellent surgical mask a disposable apron and gloves and eye protection if the patient if the resident is actually known to be positive or suspected of having covid in two meters um, you would need to wear a surgical mask again uh, no aprons and gloves re required if you are with outside that two meters and you're not having any contact and you will find uh, further guidance in the short animation link here which will show you how to don and doff your PPE correctly and is specifically aimed at um, care homes for you to review and there's also some very useful posters that you can use as well which shows the steps for donning and doffing to make sure that you are doing that safely and effectively. Sessional use. So the only items that can be used sessionally are your mask and uh, your eye protection. OK, the other items, as described, aprons and gloves must be single use only, single patient, single resident use only. So as you will see from the, t the bottom two, the items that can be used on session are the ones that protect the healthcare worker from the resident. And we talked about that being uh, PPE and the items that protect both resident and the healthcare worker can cannot be used in this way. So gloves and aprons have to be changed. So a session may include uh, a couple of hours while you're caring for a patient, helping them wash, helping them dress. Um, uh, it might be before you go to break. Uh, and uh, But if you do then have to go on your break, you have to go to a different area of, of the home, then you need to change your PPE. OK, so there's some do's and don'ts there. Um, and just to say that before you actually don your PPE, just make sure that you're ready to wear it for a period of time. So you may want to take a comfort break. Have you had enough to eat before you start your shift and put your PPE on so that um, you don't have to keep going back and changing those items on a regular basis? Um, and just to say with masks, after after wearing for about two hours, you usually find that they become quite moist on the inside and that will prompt you to go in and change change them. OK, so if they do get splashed or sprayed, if they do get very moist, then you do need to go and uh, replace your PPE. Take extra care when removing and it's a good idea to if you're practicing on donning and doffing is to, to get one of your colleagues as a buddy and uh, after looking at some of the videos and the posters, etc., you can review each other's practice and pick up the good points and the bad points. And it's still a good idea in practice. If you see one of your colleagues is not wearing their PPE correctly, there should be an open and honest culture the way you can challenge each other so that you are all because everybody's human and we all make mistakes um, and, you know, lapses of, of concentration, etc. So if you've got somebody there who's watching you and supporting you and they and you are watching them is is much more likely that the PP will be worn correctly. So there will be some residents that you will be looking after who will require aerosol generating procedures. So this is a procedure 
which is usually involved in the lower part of the respiratory tract, which will generate aerosols or tiny particles, which are more of a risk for inhalation and can actually more or less contaminate the area around the room, the air around that person. And for this, we will require additional PPE. So it'll be a long sleeve gown. Um, eye protection must be worn and you will need to be fit tested to wear, a, I should say, FFP3 respirator and um, that needs to be fitted correctly. Again, donning and doffing is going to be very important. So you may have patients who may be on non-invasive ventilation, they may have a tracheostomy and they, or they may be on high flow nasal oxygen who require uh, aerosol generating procedures, PPE. So use a, a, a good visual guide of the levels of PPE. So it's just to make sure you're wearing the correct level at the correct time. And uh, it hasn't changed greatly since the beginning of phase one of the pandemic. Just because we've got variants, it doesn't mean that we need to now step up with extra PPE because the transmission route is exactly the same. So Aleria, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Gail. Um, so hopefully that gives you an overview of the PPE and we'll just move on quickly to the admission to um, care and residential homes, which is covered um, in the IPNC checklist. Um, but just to flag that the um, ad admission discharge criteria for, um, has been updated since December um, of 2020 um, and the link is provided there for you um, and the uh, health boards and local authorities should now be following that to try and support um, effective and uh, timely admissions uh, from health boards uh, and uh, care facilities into care and residential homes and between. Um, so there's quite an useful flow chart and information within that guidance. When you have admitted um, individuals into care homes for the first time, then um, you, you may need to consider isolation of um, residents, either because they are new into the environment, stepping down from um, a health board or, or a community hospital environment, or because they've developed symptoms and you're suspecting that they might be developing uh, COVID-19. And isolation within a care home um, means that you should be considering isolating the resident in their own room, ideally with ensuite facilities, although commodes might be an option, um, or if not possible, to have their own si single room with ensuite that it, you might want to dedicate a, a bathroom near to the person's bedroom for their identified use only, or if you've got more than one case, you may then have to consider uh, zoning, etc. Um, the PPE has already been described and obviously um, should be adhered to carefully and also be very careful in terms of um, the signage to prevent unnecessary entry into uh, areas or bedrooms of the care home if you're dealing with a possible case. Room doors should be kept closed where possible and where it's safe to do so, although obviously, you know, we are in the real world and we know that people may um, need to have the, the doors open um, in order to keep uh, an overview. Um, but then this needs to be risk assessed and considered in terms of how you manage the general area that the individual is in. When you're isolating an individual, then all necessary procedures for care um, and uh, personal care should be carried out within the res resident's room and PPE of all um, staff uh, appropriate with appropriate area for removing that. Um, and where possible, you need to dedicate the specific equipment as well, medical equipment, so thermometers, blood pressure, cuffs, etc., for that resident's use only. Increasing the cleaning and disinfecting in the area would be important um, and restricting uh, the sharing of personal devices. So it's not about removing devices from the individual, uh, because obviously these can be their one mode of, com of communicating with others but making sure that um, the guidance on cleaning of these devices is followed and that they're not shared with other residents. So it's about trying to ensure that the, the, the possible case is, is uh, uh, isolated as far as possible. And I'll hand back to Gail. 
Okay, so just picking up on the decontamination theme, uh, there is specific guidance which is supported by the World Health Organization uh, uh, and also the UK IMPNC and guidance, which actually states what sort of disinfectants should be used. Uh, and a thousand parts per million of chlorine um, is with a general detergent is recommended for removing and destroying this virus. So you should only be using cleaning and detergent products which have been supplied by your employer and they need to be make sure that they are mixed accordingly and used accordingly uh, with regards to contact time, etc. We are aware of a number of companies approaching uh, care homes, but also other institutions um, claiming all sorts of uh, advantages of their product when in fact they don't uh, uh, um, they they don't meet the biocidal regulations as required for viruses and bacteria. So if you have, are concerned, you can speak to your EHO or local health board um, if you are considering using an alternative to those recommended within um, the, the UK guidance. It's really important alongside standard infection control precautions and PP that the environment is decontaminated adequately as you know the virus uh, will spread quite widely within and contaminate all sorts of areas of, of the home and so it's it's really important that all shared equipment is clean so there are items that maybe have to be shared between residents which making sure that they are cleaned between use. Where possible, use single use or designate key bits of, it, of kit uh, to a resident or a group of residents. Some things which uh, may cause uh, a risk, such as sharing magazines, um, soft furnishings, which are more difficult to decontaminate. So the, 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 and the, the, the real Oh, I'm trying to think what I'm trying to say now. Really, what we should be ensuring is that everything that we've got, we can decontaminate. Uh, we know because guidance came out uh, a year ago about the role of fans in circulating air, which potentially can actually spread infection as well. So it's it's having control of those and risk assessing. If you do need to need, use them, last year we had a very hot summer. Uh, we're now in the winter. If we're still in the position we are we were in last year and, and the weather gets hot again, we may need to revisit the risk assessment around any additional ventilation or circulation of air. So additional procedures for cleaning rooms, you know, we need to make sure that the staff who are doing the cleaning, etc., are trained in the appropriate use of PPE and standard infection control precautions. Um, if you've got a mix of residents who are positive and negative to COVID, then you should always uh, prioritise doing the uh, the areas which are, have negative pay, uh, residents, then doing the clean rooms of resident of, of residents who are COVID positive last. Um, using disposable cloths and, and mop heads, unless you've got good systems in place to uh, launder mop heads, etc., in line with the um, health tech and technical memorandum on decontamination of linen, laundry and cleaning equipment. So uh, it should be routinely clean in order from high points to low points, from furthest to closest point, and making sure you're discarding any cleaning solution at a, at a, a designated disposal point and not, as, for instance, as Amanda's raised down, any point where you might be washing hands, etc. Uh, and remove waste and linen uh, for disposal and response and reprocessing in a timely manner. So under waste management, there has been specific guidance released by National Resource Wales on waste management in care homes, namely on waste from routine care, but also now from waste from lateral flow device use. OK, so you probably will be familiar with this. So the waste that has to go into clinical waste will be that generated from those residents who are known to be COVID positive. And um, this has been issued across uh, the whole of, of Wales. And uh, you should be working with your waste manager to make sure that you are adhering to this um, closely. So if um, you've got PPE, routine care, performing meal rounds, you can see some examples there, then that will go into the tiger stripe or offensive waste stream. Also, if you've got uh, waste contaminated with blood or, or body fluids, uh, sort of incontinence pads, etc., stoma bags, that can go into offensive waste. And then lastly, 
So where the resident is suspected or confirmed of COVID, then that would need to be uh, held in a clinical waste bag. And um, if you haven't, you could need to store it securely for 72 hours uh, if, it, if, if, if you are to then put it in the correct stream. For lateral flow devices, information has been um, circulated on the waste from that as well. So the, all the packaging is non-hazardous and can go to landfill. Um, the swabs should be going ideally into a, a yellow sharps container, but it's not hazardous waste. Um, so that would be uh, offensive waste if you didn't have the appropriate packaging. Test cartridges is non-hazardous, so the same as swabs and PP um, that you use to do the sampling um, and the testing is also in the offensive waste stream. So linen and laundry, those that are suspected or, or confirmed of COVID-19, they should be managed as infectious linen and you should have processes in place for managing infectious linen now anyway. But key things, it shouldn't be handled uh, inside, you know, all linen should be handled inside the room of the resident. You need to be putting it into a laundry receptacle rather than carrying it to a disposal point and never rinse or shake or sort any linen. It needs to be put straight into a bag or receptacle uh, for removal. So um, staff uniform. So we get a lot of questions about the role of staff uniform. Um, you know, your uniform is not PPE. The PPE I've described is there to protect you. Um, but there are some good practice points about the use and wearing of, of uniform. So changing to and out of uniform at work where possible, or if if you were working out in the social care in people's homes as well, we would expect you to change uniform, etc. when you've got, got home. Um, if you're uh, transporting, uh, it, it, it put it in a disposable bag, which can be thrown away and just put your uniform into the into the washing machine wash on the hottest temperature for the fabric, tumble and iron and dry. Um, so most no, just routine uh, laundering through your own domestic washing machine will is enough, more than enough to remove this virus. There are other, other pathogens which cause infections like C. diff, which are much more likely to be remain on a uniform than COVID-19. So um, we just need to make sure that you're handling your uniform uh, as you should be anyway, aside of COVID-19. So I'll hand over to Aleri. Thank you. And um, I'm conscious that we want time for questions. So I'll run through this very quickly um, to finish off. So resident testing. Um, a single symptomatic resident, uh, I'm sure that you all know now you should be informing the EHO or Public Health Wales and when, and when there is a confirmed case we will um, move to whole home testing and a new testing strategy was released um, in earlier th earlier this year, so last month now, January, um, which you can find uh, on uh, that link there. Um, I'll skip over that. The sampling. Um, so th when when you're in certain circumstances in Wales, our, our key um, diagnostic sample is a throat swab. Uh, we use dry swab um, testing um, to go through the NHS Wales laboratories. But there will, you will be familiar with certain other settings where nose and throat samples are required because those samples go through the lighthouse laboratories um, so that so there will be slight differences. But essentially, um, all of these tests are um, validated for use for COVID-19 detection and you will come across um, these two systems of testing or sampling uh, depending on, on where you're being sampled. Uh, care home visiting, again to flag to you that the care home guidance has been updated and the link is there for you and obviously as we've indicated, you know, the visiting um, is subject to change depending on the levels of the alerts that we're at um, and also it, visitors should be complying with IP and C guidance within the care homes. And then the hot topics to finish off, um, question we get asked a lot now is that now that the vaccination programme is rolling out, uh, can we all throw our masks away? Um, which would be lovely, but that isn't the advice at the moment. So even though the vaccine rollout is going very well and we know that uh, a number of the care homes uh, now are um, have received their vaccines, um, we are still working through um, how well the vaccination um, 
does in terms of protection. And so for the moment, all IPNC controls must continue to be adhered to, whether or not the individual patients or visitors um, have been vaccinated. So we're not clear yet whether um, the immune response uh, differs between people, how long it takes uh, to gain immunity will vary between people, and the immune responses may also vary according to the underlying risk factors that any individual may have. And at the moment, we're not entirely sure whether or not the vaccination will prevent transmission. Early uh, evidence suggests it will, but while we're working this through, we need to be super cautious and therefore IPNC measures need to continue. Um, the other hot topic, of course, is the new variants of COVID-19 that have been described. Um, and there are thousands of new variants. The virus is um, mutating uh, and changing all the time, but occasionally we get more concerned about certain uh, variants which have acquired the ability to be more transmissible or to change particular key parts of the virus. Uh, the UK variant, which was first described in London and the southeast, uh, is deemed to be 50 to 70 percent more transmissible by uh, means of this uh, mutation. Um, the mode of transmission, as I said, however, has not changed. Therefore, respiratory droplets are still the, the considered mode of transmission. Um, there is some evidence, though not strong, and data still uncertain with regard to increased mortality related to the new variants. But at present, current measures are effective in reducing spread. Um, the lockdown that we're currently in, we are seeing the figures coming down, and the vaccines that we have in use are effective. This week, we have had lots of attention on the South Africa variant, and we have a few cases in Wales which we're following up very carefully. Uh, most are uh, certainly so far identified as being uh, associated with travel contacts to South Africa. Again, this variant is more transmissible, uh, but current measures effective at reducing spread and the current vaccines are still believed to be effective, although perhaps with some reduced protection, but still effective. So um, new variants will continue to be found and, and we will continue to work uh, alongside our partners to detect these and take action um, as soon as uh, needed. As I say, there's many thousands of variants. We expect the virus to mutate and we have got an excellent genomic programme in Wales, which is working with our partners and inputting data into the UK and the world uh, on all these sequences. So we are in a very good place in Wales to pick these up at an early point and to take action on them. So Diolchan Fawr Iawn and Wrando, thank you for listening. Um, we're happy to take questions. Can I just say, uh, there are a few questions in the chat that I've picked up. Uh, the first one's from Helen asking, can we clarify the difference between type 2 FRSM and type 2R FRSM? Yes, yeah, so I've picked that one up then, Amanda. So they are both surgical face masks. They are both type 2, that means they filter the same uh, amount of air through them and give you the same. But the difference between the FRSM, which is the type 2R, and the type 2 is the type 2R has that uh, fluid repellent uh, layer within the mask to stop droplets going through it. And th there's another question from Helen, which is asking, could you clarify the controls? that need to be in place during staff to staff interactions and the use of break areas and traveling to and from work. Well, I can pick that up as well. It's really important as emphasized that the social distancing is maintained throughout the home. So it's not just when you're dealing with residents, um, the staff need to maintain two meters distance, even if they've got between each other, unless they're providing care, even if they've got PPE on, should avoid sharing lifts in cars, um, because we know that has been a transmission point between staff. And therefore, if it's essential, because there is no other way that the other member of staff can get to work, then there are some key things that you can do, as in you need to wear uh, the face mask. Um, so ideally, the, the person, the passenger would sit in the back. Um, the window should be kept slightly ajar and both or all occupants should be wearing a fluid repellent surgical mask. Otherwise, if there is a transmission risk, um, you will be um, classed as a contact. Could I ask whether the decision to retest staff after 13 weeks is to be reviewed as I'm getting half staff still testing positive weekly 
after having contracted COVID, then having to isolate again and change our status at the home. So, so didn't quite catch the time frame, 13 weeks, was it? Uh, retest staff after 13 weeks is to be reviewed as I'm getting half staff still testing positive weekly after having contracted COVID. Yeah, so the, the, um, the time is 90 days um, that we recommend not retesting. Um, so that possibly does translate into 13 weeks, but um, it's it's nine, 90 days that is the um, deemed um, point at the minute. Um, I'm not um, party to any particular discussions about extending that, but I am aware that that it does cause some difficulties. So certainly we'll take that um, point away for further discussion. Um, but um, the the 90 days um, was uh, chosen because we knew that that was a point uh, that certainly um, in general terms um, you were um, less likely to find a positive related to a previous positive um, but we are aware that particularly in uh, um, with with masses of asymptomatic testing going on that we are still finding uh, after this time and when having visitors within a children's home we can't stop two meter distance, but we need to use AGPs regularly. How can we do this safely? Um, I'm not quite sure with this question um, whether um, we, you're talking about the visitors' um, safety or um, or the staff. I'm not quite sure. Uh, clearly, if if you're doing AGPs and the um, patient uh, or the, the, the children uh, are deemed to be uh, COVID-19 suspected or, or positive cases, then the, the AGP uh, requirement would be for the full PPE as per the guidance. Um, if you are in a position where uh, you do not have COVID in the home and everybody is being regularly tested um, and no symptoms, then the, the level of PPE can potentially be uh, stepped down on a, on a risk assessed basis. Um, and the visitors um, ideally would not be encouraged to visit when AGPs are being done. But obviously, if the AGPs are of such regularity that um, this is a challenge, then it would be a case of uh, risk assessing that in terms of whether or not you've got suspected cases or not at the time. And I would suggest that visitors are not visiting when when uh, you've got cases. But again, without knowing the absolute um, situation that you're in, then it, it would, you know, you'd probably have to manage that on a case by case basis. Missed the information for the vaccine for the people we support. When will this be starting? the health boards and uh, arrangements that way. So I think you'd have to direct your question um, to to colleagues uh, in, in the health in your local health board. Thank it's you. The local GPs that are, will be facilitating the rollout of the vaccines for residents. So I, I would contact the GP um, if I was you. Thank I you. did that and they've reassured me and, and given me some some dates. Uh, I'm the manager at Church Court Care Home. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the value of the VLT fogging, whether we think that that's um, productive to manage uh, some of the COVID and infection control as an additional protocol. OK, shall I, shall I pick that up? I'm not exactly sure what devices you're using. You know, the uh, fogging, the, the, the smoke, you know, where, right. almost like a smoke, uh, a fogging VLT system. OK, so there's two, is two, two issues and health and safety executive have released uh, a safety information sheet on misting and that refers to not using any misting devices for staff or visitors or anybody to walk through. Uh, so there's a safety issue there. And also um, the WHO have got some specific guidelines on what should be used for cleaning and decontamination. And only last week HSE have released um, uh, their latest safety bulletin with a paper on uh, on using fogging devices and if you are using them they would have to be as an adjunct to the other cleaning methods not instead of the effectiveness of 
or a lot of them have not been proven for COVID-19. So I unless I got further information, I think you should discuss it with your DHO or the local health board, because as I said, a number of these devices are not actually effective against COVID. Um, uh, but we are aware of companies offering trials, pilots of them when they don't actually comply with the biocidal regulation. That helps, Lisa. But if you want to contact us outside, I can, I can pick that up with you. Ted, can I also ask, uh, whilst I'm on, uh, our medication rooms, and I've got five dedicated medication rooms, each um, allocated to a single household usage. But we do actually use um, air conditioning to manage the temperatures. Are we advocating the use of air conditioning at the moment? Uh, the guidance is that um, the air conditioning can be left running as, as it is. And obviously, you should hopefully have that regularly serviced. If there's any filters in there, should have been changed as per schedule. Um, so it's just to make sure that it is running correctly. It has been serviced and maintained, but otherwise you do not need to switch it off. That's fantastic. Thank you. Just to say there's a link to the HSE document that uh, Gail was referring to about fogging as well in the chat. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just wanted to highlight as well on the cleaning is that um, we did uh, issue some cleaning standards for hospitals for COVID-19 and Amanda has been working busily to um, make the same document available for care homes but specific to your area so we're just working on that document it gives you some uh, better information on the standard you should be trying to achieve for cleaning um, and uh, hopefully you will see that in the near future. Can you confirm how we dispose of lateral flow testing equipment? So after we've carried out the lateral flow test um, and it's negative. There is a slide in the slide set yeah, uh, and there is specific guidelines from National Resources Ways on lateral flow testing. So the PPE would go into the offensive waste stream. The actual um, slide and swab would go into a, a yellow sharps box for disposal. Um, that's within because it's within a care setting. There are different arrangements out in the community where lateral flow is being spread out for schools, etc. So um, we can share that information with you as well. Yes, yeah, that, that would be helpful. And I'll pick up um, there because there's a related question from Kerry. I'm just wondering with the um, lateral flow device tests. I've been informed by my environmental health officer that they're actually quite unreliable. So if and when we start visitors again, how can we rely on the results when using um, on visitors? Um, so in, in relation to um, the lateral flow device tests, they they um, in all uh, tests, diagnostic tests have a sensitivity and specificity. Um, and so, you know, there will always be a certain level of false positives and false negatives, whatever test you do. Um, so it's not a case that the lateral flow device tests are unreliable. Um, they they just um, are um, perhaps a bit less sensitive than some of the other tests that we use. But in the context of um, the, the way they're being used, they should be used as an adjunct to all your other measures in the sense that they give you added information. You know, you should still be ensuring that visitors have not been in contact with a case that they shouldn't be visiting if they, you know, have have um, symptoms. They shouldn't be visiting uh, if they've recently travelled from somewhere that's on a, a banned list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that the the lateral flow device test is an adjunct then to assist people with um, testing and so that you know they are uh, very good a positive is very very definitely a positive um, and obviously a, a positive would mean that the individual should not be visiting um, and it should be used to assist with the process of uh, um, feeling a bit more comfortable with um, uh, visit visiting when we are allowed to to go back to that can you please send the link for disposing of lateral flow testing please well we will share the the slide set we're happy to do that and um, where do um we've got a member of staff who's um the face mask he's struggling to fit his face um 
because it's too small. Is there a larger mass? Unfortunately, there is only one universal size for an FRSM. Yeah. Um, so it's it's looking to see how it's actually you can make the fit better. Um, are you saying that he's got his face? He's, yes, he has a very long face, but he also has a beard as well. OK, so that that's not that's not going to help the situation, no. but it is uh, uh, revisiting the training to see if you can try to get it to make it a fit uh, more closely. Um, there are slightly different manufacturers of the FRSM masks and it may be worth trying a different manufacturer because they are slightly different shapes and sizes. Um, but it's just uh, making sure he's got all the training points for fitting it. Yeah. Um, and seeing if if you can get a different make, uh, which might be a slightly different shape. And um, sometimes if they're not in wide supply, but sometimes if they have got ties on them, they are able to actually uh, tie them much more securely. But most of the supply that we've got for COVID are looped. Yeah, they're all looped, yeah. Just to say it is something that Welsh Government and across the UK, they're looking forward about as well about the face fit of the universal mass because it's not just that you know in this country it is only one size universal across the whole of the world at the moment um and so those are one of the innovations they need to look at to get that good fit